so I welcome you all to the LSEC seminar series by Zoom. And uh, so before we start, as usual, I have a few instructions about the format. During the talk, you are asked to remain in mute mode unless you wish to ask a question. And of course, you are encouraged to do so. We will also have time at the end for questions, starting with students' questions, followed by faculty and guests. So it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Christian Doller. Christian Doller did his PhD in psychology in the Saarland University in Germany. And then he did his postdoc with Neil Burgess at UCL. And now he is a director of the Max Planck Institute of Human Cognitive and Brain Sciences at Leipzig and a professor at the Kavli Institute in Trondheim, Norway. His labs are focused on how spatial neural codes are used also to represent cognitive spaces. And among his key discoveries is the grid-like coding in the human hippocampal formation during virtual navigation, visual exploration, and also during concept learning. Uh, Christian, you are welcome to step in and the screen is all yours. Great, excellent. Thanks so much, uh, uh, David, for the uh, kind invitation and the introduction. As I said before, it's a bit of a funny experience to um, have meetings all day and then quickly go for one hour to Israel, give a talk and then come back. Um, next time I'm going to visit. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, let me quickly see with the remote control. OK, do you see my yeah, do you see my mouse? Moving, yeah, okay, good. Um, so we we are a cognitive neuroscience lab, so we are interested in how um, fundamental cognitive operations are implemented um, in the human brain. And we use uh, usually use non-invasive neuroimaging te techniques such as fMRI, but also MEG um, uh, to investigate these underlying uh, neural processes. Uh, so I was always fascinated by, by cognition. So what, what are the key mechanisms, the key underlying um, aspects of uh, human thinking, memory formation and, and other processes? And I have chosen um, human memory as sort of my model system in my scientific approach because I was always fascinated by memory and um, the impact also on, on our personality. Uh, effectively, we um, all the information we encode and then form memories that defines our existence to some extent. And um, when you look at uh, neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease, you see how uh, a degradation of these processes leads to um, a change of, 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 of uh, the personality. So memory is a model system, but we, in, especially in recent years, we try to branch out into other cognitive domains and examine um, uh, neural processes in these other domains. When we talk about memory, of course, and, and, and the brain, we need to talk about the hippocampal formation. Uh, so the, the hippocampus and the surrounding uh, rhinal and parohippocampal cortices. Um, and uh, initially the, the, the whole research in human participants and patients started uh, with the discoveries around uh, the famous patient HM. And you see a picture of the patient here. Uh, it was actually um, at the occasion of his, um, uh, unfortunately, at the occasion of his death, where he became one of the most famous patients in neuroscience and uh, received obituaries in all the big international newspapers. So uh, as you all know, uh, he suffered, uh, and that was in the 50s of the last century, he suffered from uh, severe epilepsy. So the neurosurgeons at the time removed large parts of uh, his hippocampus. And uh, the good news was that um, his seizures disappeared. So he didn't suffer from epileptic seizures anymore. But at the same time, he was not able to form new memories. So he lost his uh, central memory function. Um, and Following this discovery um, uh, of, of the memory impairments in AHM, the, the whole research line, neuropsychological research line, behavioral work in, in, in patients, but also uh, then later with the advent of neuroimaging technologies, non-invasive neuroimaging um, uh, developed into bigger research lines. In parallel, and uh, I guess many of you are experts in that, um, in, in, in animal research, in electrophysiology, 
sort of parallel to that development, people, of course, also were interested, highly interested in the very same structure, the hippocampal formation in rodents. And um, uh, sort of the basic experimental setup is that um, you record a single cell or single unit activity from tetrodes implanted in the brain of, of rodents while they uh, are involved in a task. So usually they forage for food in a recording box and um, the experimenter brings to, together the single unit activity, the single cell activity uh, in the recorded region with the behavior in that case, the navigation behavior, the position, the running direction of the animal. And um, as you all know, John O'Keefe uh, discovered in the early 70s of the last century at UCL in London, uh, the so-called place cells. So those are um, uh, cells in the hippocampus which signal the animal's position. And in the, um, the weight maps, what you see here is on the top left of the slide. Um, and, and each single, single plot illustrates the activity of a single play cell. And for instance, this cell over here fires, so expressed in, in, in red colors is the high firing rate, fires at, at that location. And other cells recorded actually from O'Keefe, his data are from John O'Keefe. Um, we call um, uh, other cells signal other positions in the environment. And the assumption is that the uh, population response, the summed uh, activity in all those cells provides something like a map-like representation of the local environment. And then uh, only in 2005, so 15 years ago, uh, Edward and Maybrit Moser in Trondheim, Norway, discovered a nearby anterior cortex. And nearby means only one synapse away from the hippocampus the so-called grid cells, enterorhinal grid cells. And in contrast um, to the play cells, the, the a single grid, cell, so in the in case of the play cells, a single cell usually only has a, a single place field, a single receptive field signaling only one position. In contrast, the enterorhinal grid cells, they signal, a single cell uh, signals multiple positions. And those positions are arranged in this uh, rigid, regular hexagonal structure. That's why they are, uh, called grid cells. Uh, of course, those cells, uh, and many of you work in, in these areas, uh, these cells are not alone in the hippocampal formation. There's a whole uh, array, a whole zoom of spatially tuned cell types, uh, um, such as uh, in place in grid cells, but also head direction cells encoding uh, the, um, uh, the head direction of the animal, border cells encoding the uh, environmental borders, speed cells, object vector cells and so forth, and new discoveries are made. And importantly, these uh, cell types have not only been discovered in, in rodents, uh, but also as uh, uh, David and others can tell you in, in, in the bats, uh, in uh, non-human primates. Um, and uh, there's also some evidence from intracranial recordings that some of those cells also exist in the human brain. Um, and as you all know, uh, O'Keefe and the Moses received the Nobel Prize uh, in medicine for this discovery um, and, and the entire discoveries of the field uh, in, uh, in 2014. So as I said before, we, uh, we are cognitive neuroscience lab, so we are interested um, how these uh, coding principles work in the human brain. And what we think is that given the evidence of these map-like representations in the rodent brain, that uh, the similar coding principles in the human brain might give rise not only to spatial memory and navigation, but also to higher level cognition uh, in more general. So when you think about um, uh, um, how the brain might store abstract information, such as um, a representation of different types of vehicles, as in my example here, you could represent that information in a spatial format. So imagine you have all these different vehicles here. You could uh, represent them in terms of the weight uh, plotted uh, in the example on the uh, y-axis and uh, the engine power on the, on the x-axis in the example. So a racing car, which has a high engine power, uh, but is relatively light, would be positioned over here. Uh, a lorry, um, which is quite heavy uh, and also has a high engine power would be located over here. And then you have a family van somewhere in between. So you could represent information about, um, uh, about the concept, if you like, of, 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 of vehicles, a car space in such a spatial format. Uh, 
And we think and that's actually what we are testing um, over the years, an overarching hypothesis that this spatial coding principle in the hippocampal antivirion system provides something like a geometric code for higher level cognition. Um, and of course, we are not alone with that ideas. I, ideas go back to, uh, to Tolman's initial formulation of the cognitive map theory, then revisited by O'Keefe and Nadell in the uh, 70s. Uh, when O'Keefe discovered the, um, uh, the place cells in the hippocampus, and then, of course, also uh, significantly extended by people like Howard Eichenbaum into the memory domain. Uh, and just to briefly outline, and, and, and I will touch on a couple of those principles throughout the talk, um, we identified some sort of key, four key principles where we think, well, how we think that the hippocampal antiviral system might support the formation of these cognitive spaces. Of course, first of all, um, uh, the mapping function is really crucial. So the system has to somehow map these different concrete or abstract spaces. Um, to store information, it's also um, efficient to store information at multiple hierarchical levels. And there's evidence from uh, place and grid cell recordings that the spatial scale of the code varies along anatomical axis in the, in the structure. And that might also be very important for understanding these cognitive spaces. Um, the system needs to be highly dynamic. So in one situation, you might want to represent vehicles along these two dimensions I just described in my examples. But in another situation where you want to actually, for instance, buy a car, um, something, uh, and a representation of these vehicles along the dimensions of the price of the vehicle and the number of passenger might be relevant. So you can should be able to dynamically switch this representation. And there's a lot of evidence for these remapping functions in place and grid cells. And finally, to make decisions, you also need to have an efficient readout of these spaces. For the key studies um, uh, to examine these uh, spatial mapping functions in humans, we usually use virtual reality because um, we are usually recording within a brain scanner and we can't really put the brain scanner on participants' head and let them actually navigate around in the physical world. So we need to bring in the uh, the, the space into the scanner. So we are exposing participants to these um, uh, virtual reality navigation tasks. We usually keep them busy. They have to remember different locations in these environments. We have limited environments. They look a bit more like the rodent environments or more realistic environments like these um, uh, um, city-like environments. And uh, David was referring to that in his uh, introduction uh, back at my time at uh, UCL working with me virtues. Um, uh, we were really keen, the Moses just recently then uh, discovered the grids that we were really keen whether there's something similar like a grid-like representation in the human brain. So um, by sort of tackling hippocampal place representation, we, we were a bit skeptical because the, the place cell system is a complicated system. So different cells are doing different things and they remap and map in different fashions. For the grid cells, at least what we know is that um, uh, for significant portions of entorhinal cortex, despite the fact that the different grid cells cover different parts of the environment, so the, the, the spacing difference differs and also the, the, the phases differ, what is relatively constant, at least in modules in entorhinal cortex, is the overall orientation of the grid system. So the, uh, that's illustrated here in the schematic, the overall orientation of this hexagonal or hexadirectional uh, um, map is constant across cells. So uh, the large proportion of cells have the same orientation. And this fact we try to take advantage of in our fMRI approach. And as you know, with fMRI, we only indirectly measure um, uh, neuronal activity uh, via the oxygenation level in the blood. And we, of course, also ha um, have a poor resolution compared to uh, electrophysiology because uh, uh, 10,000, if not 100,000 of cells are, are um, sort of summarized in activity in a signal volume, uh, voxel uh, volume element of our brain signal. But nevertheless, what we were looking for is a systematic variation of fMRI activity as a function of the running direction of participants through the virtual reality environment. When you see that here, so that's an aerial view of a VR environment. And this is like in the rodent experiments, the navigation path of our participants. So what we always do in these analysis, and I present you a couple of examples later, um, 
we analyze our, our fMRI activity as a function of the running direction of participants to these environments. And the idea is that given the hexadirectional hexagonal structure of the grid system, we would expect um, activity following a six peak periodicity when we plot activity as a function of running, uh, uh, running direction of participants. And in our initial studies, and we have replicated, we and other labs uh, many times now, we see an evidence for that, what we call a hexadirectional sickness or activity in androvirin cortex. That's what you see here. Um, varies as a function of running direction with this clear six peak structure. And you see the data here plotted from androvirin cortex. What we also saw, and we were very excited about that in that initial study is that the strength of this signal, not the overall average strength of enterovirinal activity, but the strength of this six peak modulation in enterovirinal cortex correlates with spatial memory. So when participants and our standard task there is an object location memory task where the participants pick up objects, bring them back to the location where they picked them up before and we measure the spatial distance between their response location and the correct location. And what we see is that in participants with the, with the best memory, that's, that's also those participants who have the strongest six peak modulation of activity. In our mission to um, sort of branch out to other cognitive domains and identify these coding principles, um, uh, the coding principles underlying uh, cognition beyond the uh, navigation domain, uh, we were in one study, and I want to give you an example on that. Uh, we're interested how uh, um, how the um, uh, enterovirinal cortex encodes what we call visual space. So um, this study builds a bit on um, non-human primate work uh, by uh, Liz Buffalo's lab from the US. They recorded activity in um, non-human primates from enterovirinal cortex, single unit activity, while the animals were looking at different visual scenes like this one, the horses uh, at the beach. And they also concurrently record the eye movements of the participants. So what they can do then, um, like the, the rodent researchers who bring together the position of the animal in the environment and the cell activity, they can in their study bring together um, the gaze position, so where the participant, uh, where the, uh, the the participant, the monkey is looking at, um, and the selectivity. And what they see is that in enterovirinal cortex, you have a grid-like signal when participants look at these different positions on the screen. So something like a visual grid cell. Uh, to examine that in humans, what we, and this is work by Matthias now, a postdoc uh, in my lab, who is actually moving today, interestingly, uh, to the NIH and flies to Washington, D.C. Um, uh, so what Matthias did, he developed a task where um, participants look on the screen. We concurrently in the scanner also record their eye movements with eye tracking, and they see a moving, a moving dot that moves around on the screen. And unknown to the participant, it moves around with a very specific trajectory. So it's a quite boring task. Participants have to always follow that moving dot. And um, what we then do, like we did in our uh, virtual reality navigation studies, we analyze enterovirinal activity as a function, in that case, not of the virtual running direction, but rather as a function of the gaze direction, how they follow this dot um, on the screen. And we also see, like in the navigation studies, here evidence that in enterovirinal cortex, activity um, oscillates with this six peak modulation as a function of, in that case, the gaze direction. And uh, what we usually do is we, we compare um, uh, trials in which they, they are sort of aligned to this six peak modulation compared to those trials where they are misaligned. So when you think back about the uh, grid firing schematic I showed you, um, sort of runs where they go along the, the, the inferred firing pattern and in between, we see this significant effect in enterovirinal cortex. Um, what we usually do, of course, to be sure that it's a six peak modulation, we run several control models. So we look at the very same analysis at different periodicities, in that case, four, five, seven, and eight uh, uh, peak symmetries. So where we would for the entire 360 degree range expect four rather than six peaks or five or seven or eight. We don't see evidence for that in enterovirinal cortex. 
And we can also, of course, look at other brain regions and look at that six peak grid like modulation. And we don't see evidence uh, for that effect in these control regions in that case, visual, frontal, motor, and parietal regions. Maybe coming back a bit more to um, electrophysiology, also to make the link again uh, to the rodent work. Um, we also uh, did a similar approach looking at um, um, uh, MEG activity. Um, so Tobias Staudigl, um, a previous postdoc in the lab who has his own ESC team now uh, in Munich uh, at the university. Um, so he, a bit like in the Buffalo monkey study shows participants, I think I should have that here, yeah, shows participants various images of uh, different visual scenes. Also records um, uh, eye movements with an eye tracker. That's what you see here. And at the same time records MEG activity with an MEG machine. So that is small magnetic, uh, small fluctuations um, of magnetic signals recorded from the surface um, of the head, uh, indicative of, uh, of uh, neuronal activity. And um, then we do exactly the same thing like in Matthias' fMRI study. We analyze the, in that case, the MEG activity, not the fMRI activity, but the MEG activity. And I should say largely in the gamma frequency range as a function of the gaze direction of participants. So where, how, how do they move their eyes on the screen? And we also see evidence for this six peak modulation of in that case, MEG activity in the gamma range uh, as a function of the gaze direction. And with MEG, because you record the signal from the surface of the head, um, you have techniques such as um, source localization techniques to localize the source, the most likely source of the signal. And what you see here in that plot, the signal uh, emerges from um, the medial temporal lobe. It's very difficult to disentangle entorhinal cortex from hippocampus or actually um, impossible, but it's coming from the right region, put it that way, uh, from the anterior medial temporal lobe. Question? Of course. Uh, is 10 to the minus 27 a significant number? Yeah, this has to do with, this, uh, with the scaling of the, um, of the signal, I think, yeah. But well spotted. <laughs> So um, what we um, then also do in these data is we um, look at different yeah, control periodicities, different um, uh, control symmetries, don't see evidence for that. We can in that case with, um, uh, with um, uh, uh, EOG also look at unspecific um, movements uh, of the eyes, don't see evidence for that in the EOG signal. And of course, MEG is a fantastic technique because we get millisecond resolution like in the rodent electrophysiology, but unfortunately only recorded from the surface of the head. So what, Mathia, uh, what Tobias did is uh, uh, he also uh, got data from uh, Charlie Schroeder's and uh, Josh Jacobs lab at um, Columbia University in New York, who have access to um, patients who are implanted uh, due to clinical reasons with uh, um, um, uh, tetrodes and electrodes. And uh, we had, uh, we were fortunate and got data from entorhinal recordings, which is not very uh, often done. And at the same time, um, those patients also, um, uh, also the, the eye movements were recorded. So we could do the very same analysis we see um, with the, gamma signal coming from entorhinal cortex in these patients. And we also see evidence for this six peak modulation of gamma activity in entorhinal cortex as a function of the gaze direction of the patient. Uh, this has also been shown in, in, in other work by um, Nicola Axmacher's group and by Josh Jacobs himself. So to summarize a bit uh, sort of the, uh, these studies, um, we think that vision and navigation share, share uh, key computational uh, mechanisms. And there are, especially from Beth Buffalo's lab, a lot of cell types now described in the non-human primate, which you could, just could describe as a visual analog of the navigation system. So they all, not only saw evidence for grid cells, uh, 
uh, visual grid cells, but also for mu cells and uh, and cells which encode the border of the um, of the visual field. Um, and uh, yeah, we think that the hippocampal formation helps to uh, mediate representation of the visual space to guide viewing behavior and um, also subsequent decision making. To branch, branch out into another domain, um, let me uh, uh, describe some work we did um, on abstract spaces. So, um, and let me start with uh, describing a study by Tim Behrens lab from, uh, from Oxford University and, uh, and UCL. So what Tim Behrens group did, they exposed participants uh, to an abstract um, feature space. So they didn't really show them the space, but they um, engaged them in a, uh, in a learning task so that they were then indirectly exposed to that space. So um, participants had to learn to associate different um, objects. And you soon see them here in that plot plotted as, uh, as small symbols here. And they associated these stimuli with different examples of birds, of, of, of virtual birds. And these birds, unknown to the participants, differed in the leg length and the neck length, so that you effectively um, learned an abstract two-dimensional space along the dimensions of leg length and neck length of these birds. And these different objects were then effectively positioned in different, different locations in that space. And when, uh, after the participants learned that representation, they, um, uh, were exposed to trajectories through that space uh, in the fMRI scanner, in the MR scanner. And when they analyze these trajectories through that abstract space uh, with the very same analysis pipelines we developed for the navigation and also the visual studies, they also see evidence for the six peak modulation of entorhinal activity while participants um, yeah, sort of navigate through that abstract space. A bit of the disadvantage of this hexadirectional approach which we developed is that it's insensitive to the position or blind to the position. It's, it's effectively only a trick to get some sort of insight into the system with our um, coarse fMRI measure. So um, it doesn't really tell you about positional coding within the space. Um, so what we did uh, in, in, in another study is to understand the sort of distance coding or positional coding in these abstract spaces a, a bit more. So what we did is like in the Tim Barron study, we uh, developed um, also a task with two abstract dimensions. In that case, the opacity and the circle size of these abstract symbols. And then we let participants associate in this association task. Again, participants never saw that space. What they see is they learn to associate different objects with these abstract feature combinations. And what we also, um, uh, um, in addition to the original pure feature space study in, uh, in the case of the bird space I just described, we let people categorize um, those stimuli into an A category and B category. And the definition of A and B is just simply done by the spatial position of the feature combination in the space. So all the uh, everything which lies above the diagonal of that two-dimensional space is, is A category and the other is B category. So this is work done by uh, Stephanie Teves, a postdoc in the lab. So what we see in participants um, is that they learn these associations over time in a learning session. They also learn to categorize uh, these items along the, um, uh, the, the two-dimensional space. We also have at the end of the experiment some sort of navigation task where they have to um, uh, change the features so they can edit the feature space to come from one object to another object. And they learn that over time. What we then do for the FMI analysis is um, what I just described all these different learning sessions. They sort of sit in between two FMI sessions. And in these two FMI sessions, they, um, they are really relatively simple where we present these objects, which we associate with the feature combinations later, we present them multiple times to get a high SNR of measuring neural activity elicited by these objects. So object after object, 
in a pre-block. Then we have all that learning, uh, the, all these learning sessions, and then we expose them to the objects again subsequently. Um, and then what we do is with techniques such as fMRI adaptation, but also representation and similarity analysis, we look then at the change of object representations as a function of our learning manipulation. And with learning manipulation, I mean, we position these items in the abstract space. We also um, yeah, effectively manipulate the distance between these objects within the abstract space. And that's what we measure then with fMRI. We can now, with, that is an example of fMRI adaptation, and uh, we also did that with representational similarity techniques. We can then look at um, distance dependent adaptation effects or neural similarity effects. So with the idea that items which are closer together in the abstract space should have a higher neural similarity after the learning session compared to before, uh, or, or likewise with fMRI adaptation. So what we see is with both techniques, evidence for a, yeah, a distance coding effect in hippocampus as a function of the distance objects have in this abstract feature space. And uh, we don't see that effect in control regions like occipital cortex or post-central gyrus. You might wonder uh, whether that is only a feature space representation. So you associate the objects with specific features and you might reactivate those feature combinations or whether it's really a conceptual representation. So what Stefanie did in a follow-up study is, and I don't wanna go into much detail into the study, but just to get across the key idea, rather than having a two-dimensional space, now we have a three-dimensional feature space. So we not only have, um, uh, two dimensions, but we have the dimensions of opacity, frequency stripes, and frequency dots. And participants learn to associate again these objects from the first study with feature combinations coming from these uh, three dimensions. And then during the actual um, uh, categorization task, that's the important manipulation, only two of the three dimensions are relevant for the concept, are relevant to uh, distinguish between the A and the B category. And then what Stephanie does is in the fMRI analysis, she does exactly the same like in the previous studies. She looks whether there's a systematic change of um, fMRI adaptation and neural similarity measures as a function of the distance of the objects in the feature space. And what we see is that the hippocampus seems to be sensitive to the two-dimensional distances in the, yeah, you could call it conceptually relevant part of the space, but not to the three-dimensional distances in the overall feature space. Of course, you might wonder, oh yeah, this effect is significant because the 3D representation is more complex and the 2D dimension is, is more simple. We did some uh, controls to control for that, for complexity. So you can, of course, also define these two other two-dimensional spaces by combining one relevant um, dimension with the, the third irrelevant dimensions and um, get different distance measures. And we don't see evidence that the hippocampus is sensitive to those distances. Let me come back to, um, uh, to spatial navigation again. And I would like to describe in a bit more detail an fMRI study um, uh, uh, we, um, we are working on. Um, or submitted for publication. It's worked together with uh, a previous postdoc, um, at Josh Julian, who is now working uh, at Princeton University. So we were interested how dynamic the system is. Um, I showed you my example with the sort of remapping of these conceptual spaces. And um, as you know, there's a lot of evidence that the, the the place and also the grid cell system changes when you change the environment. So the, especially for the place cells, it's quite prominent that uh, the whole cell population seems to remap. So cells which fire at one position um, in one environment might be firing at a completely different position in another environment, or they might be silent in the second environment, or there are new cells which are recruited in the second environment. So there's a high dynamic in the system. On the other hand, it's also quite a stable system because when you then re-expose the animal to the old environment, put it back into the first environment, the map of the first environment is, is reactivated. So 
it's it's on the one hand a stable system, but at the same time also allows the dynamic to uh, to map new spaces. So we were interested in the in, in this dynamic remapping function of the system in humans, but at the same time we wanted to understand how that translates into behavior. Um, so what Josh did is he developed um, a new virtual reality navigation task uh, where participants um, uh, navigated two different environments. So we had, um, maybe that becomes apparent, yeah, here's, they navigate two different environments in a learning phase, a, a square environment and a circle environment, square in red, circle in blue. They learn four objects one, two, three, four in these two environments. It's the same object, same object identity, but we locate them at different positions in the circle in the square. Um, and we also have different extra maze, you could call it extra maze landmarks. So you see different trees here, for instance. Uh, they are illustrated here in these schematics around the environment, yeah? And then critically to understand how these remapping function works in humans and how that translates into behavior, uh, Josh, in a final test session, exposes participants to a third environment, an ambiguous environment, where he be test memory. We don't give them feedback, we only test their memory. And we call it a squircle environment. So it's a effectively half circle, half square. I come back to that uh, in a second. So um, let me briefly describe the, the behavior. Um, so overall, um, it takes them a bit longer to uh, respond in the in the in the squircle environment. So this is the response latency. So the trial dura duration. We show participants an image of an object. They navigate to the location where they picked it up, and then at least in the learning environments, they get feedback about it. Um, the paths don't differ. So we plot path uh, to atrocity here. Uh, that doesn't differ between the um, between the three environments, the three contexts. What you see in this plot C might be quite important. So that are heat maps um, describing the response density of um, responses of participants um, in, the, in, the, in this ambiguous squircle environment. And uh, what we plot is color coded how much the response is square-like and circle-like. So that comes back a couple of times in the next couple of slides. Um, uh, so in the, in the squircle environment, we don't give them feedback. So there is no true location, but effectively there are two valid positions. If you encode that environment as a circle, you replace an object at one position. If, it's, if you rep represent it um, as a square, then you might represent, uh, present it at a different position. So when you look at that here, when you think about the object location for object two, if you think the squircle, is a square, you replace it over here. If you think it's a cir circle, you replace it over here. So what you see here in these density plots is that participants, they usually don't place it in between or so. They choose either the circle object location or the square object location when they are exposed to this ambiguous squircle. So the densities fall around the two locations. And um, yeah, of course. Um, I'd like to get some sense for how strong the similarity is. For, for, so for example, you could uh, compare it to the similarity under repeated uh, uh, visits to the, to the square environment. Let's say train, uh, compare in one square environment, the similarity to a previous visit to the square environment. So how strong is the signal in the peak here, say when you're close to the square area to what you would see under that condition? So you mean we would constantly test also in the square environment? Yeah, I, I just want to get some sense whether the similarity to the activity when the animal was in a square environment, say, is strong or is perhaps it's very weak. It's, it's yeah. significant, but weak. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's human participants, by the way, um, in that case. Yeah. Um, uh, the, um, we didn't test that, but what we see is that um, uh, participants, different participants had different preferences of how they treat one specific object. And that roughly, and I think I have it on the, yeah, I have it here. Um, the, the, the plot G might, might answer your question. So um, what we plot here is the number of participants 
uh, replacing. Uh, so how do they replace um, in the? Uh, do they replace tr uh, square consistent or circle consistent in the in the ambiguous squircle environment? And it's roughly half half. And what we see in sort of analysis of the single participants, it's really that if participants choose how to, so they either have a circular representation and then also maintain that for that object in the in the squircle. Not sure if that answers your question. Okay. Um, just to describe these other two plots. Um, Yeah, this is just that they don't in the squircle. They they um, what we plot here is the uh, the um, is the the evidence. So for um, or is the distance from the context consistent location. Um, so um, the chance level would actually be the um, uh, the uh, the dashed line here. So if they would randomly replace in the squircle if they would have no memory. So, um, and the, they are replacing and every line here indicates one participant and the darker color here um, indicates the average response of participants. So participants significantly deviate from a random response location in the squircle, but are much closer to either the square, square or the uh, circle positions. Um, that's that evidence here in, in, in that plot. And it roughly falls half-half. Um, coming to the fMRI data, first focusing on the hippocampus. So um, uh, what we do in, what we see in plot A is um, we train a classifier, um, a multivariate classifier on the fMRI data in the original learning sessions to classify whether based on fMRI activity during the replace phase in the environments, whether we can decode from hippocampal activity, um, whether participants are in either the uh, square or the circle environment. And we can do that significantly from hippocampal activity. Um, and let me also describe uh, plot C directly. So there, what we do there is we use the very same classifier. So a classifier trained on the original circle and square environments in the learning phase to decode the behavior in the squircle, in the ambiguous squircle. In the ambiguous squircle, either your response is circle consistent or square consistent. And that's effectively the label for the, um, for the classifier here. And we see also evidence that the hippocampus the hippocampus sort of um, significantly reactivates the original circle or square representations in the squircle environment when you respond in either the circle or the square consistent way. Plots B and D show you a bit of the, the temporal um, effect of that. What we do here is um, uh, on the single trial level, uh, rather than using pattern classification, we look at the neural similarity of all hippocampal voxels to the template, the environment specific template. So we have a template in terms of road and electrophysiology, you, would, you could compare it to a population vector analysis. You have a population vector of how all the voxels, um, the, the distribution of the signal across all voxels in the square or the circle, and then compare every trial how similar the current trial pattern over time through the trial is to that template. And what you see is what means rotation. So initially we rotate participants in the environment and then they replace, then they navigate to the location where they picked up the object. And you see that sort of uh, these uh, representations uh, diverge between a um, square and the, uh, and the circle environment. So you see then as a sort of significant significant reactivation, if you like, of the original representation. And we also see that in the, um, in the um, uh, squircle, in the ambiguous environment, that um, uh, based, again, this is then informed by behavior, because this is one environment only, but you have circle-like and square-like trials here. You see the sort of the um, divergence of the representation when you do the trial. 
So I promise last complicated slide on that study and I hope I manage myself to go through that. So um, we, um, um, we look then at, um, we look at sort of how is the effect driven? How is this sort of hippocampal um, context separation remapping like effect uh, how is that driven? How is that effect driven? Um, so uh, what we see here for the um, uh, for the original environments, the square and the circle, circle um, we see that the effect is is not driven by locomotion. So for the walking, that's W, and the um, standing still S uh, trials, we. We, we see um, a significant uh, decoding effects here. So um, uh, square trials can be separated by, from circle trials. Um, interestingly, in the um, squircle environment, in the ambiguous environment, we do only see the effect for walking. So the separation it looks a bit like at the beginning when they stand still, they still don't separate the original representations, but only when they walk, either the square or the circle activation um, become uh, reactivation becomes active. Um, then uh, this plot C shows you um, that the effect, and here we plot again this context separation scores in the hippocampus, is um, uh, does not in the squircle does not differ between positions. So you have the similar evidence for a square reactivation and the circle reactivation below. No matter, sorry, excuse me. Um, no matter where you are position-wise in the um, in the squircle, you also and that shows the um, it does not differ, differ whether you are more in the sort of square part of the in the squircle environment indicated in red or more in the circle part of the um, of the squircle. And um, it also does not depend whether you walk towards, so it's a direction specific control analysis, whether you walk towards the curved corners or the, um, the cur curved corners, nice, nice expression, the curved parts of the environment compared to the, uh, the corners of the squircle. And likewise, that's the last plot here, it does not differ whether you walk along or towards the extra maze cues in the original square or circle environment. So that meaning that it's not the visual appearance of the square or um, the, the, the corners or the, the curved elements, nor the extra maze, the environment specific and envi uh, extra maze cues which are present in the squircle, um, nor the position where you are, which drives the effect. Finally, very last plot about, um, about that study um, is we also were interested, of course, in entorhinal cortex. So what we, what we did just in brief, we did run the hexadirectional analysis I described before in the two original environments, square and circle. And um, we see when we Combine both, we see significant effect in entorhinal cortex, a significant six peak modulation of activity as a function of running direction, as I described before. As a sort of sanity check, what we can do is then, because what we do is with that analysis, we estimate something like um, uh, um, a, a hypothetical grid orientation or a, a preferred direction. And we do that separately for the square, square and the circle. And then we can use the estimated orientation of one environment and test for an effect in the other. And when we do that, we don't see an effect, of course, because the two different environments differ. They likely have a different uh, preferred encoding direction. Um, and uh, so what you see here, when we estimate the, the phase or the direction of this hexadirectional signal in the, in the square, and test it on in the other half of the square, we see a significant effect. Not so if we use the grid orientation from the circle and vice versa. And then finally, what is important, what we do then in the squircle, um, uh, we test effectively two models against each other, a memory consistent and a memory inconsistent model. The memory consistent model is a bit like 
the, the analysis logic like for the hippocampal analysis I described. In every squircle trial, we have a prediction based on the behavior of participants, which object location they choose, how they treat that environment. So we can use um, the grid orientation, intervinal signal preference, um, directional preference from the square or the circle and test that in the squircle environment, actually on a, on a, on a trial by trial level. Or we can have a control model, which is inconsistent with that. And what we see is that we see evidence for this consistent model in the squircle. So it looks like in every trial in the, um, in the squircle, the system seems to reactivate the representation from the original circle or square environment. And that of course predicts then how they treat the environment, what object location they choose. Can I ask um, a question about uh, this one? Of course, yeah. Um, I need to quickly um, switch to another part of the presentation, but go ahead and ask a question. In the I was just curious about the frequency. So they're exposed to circles and squares to the same extent, right? In this setup? Exactly, yeah. And would you think that if, if you would expose them, say, more to circles, that people would start to represent, like, would that be weighted, the frequency with which they're exposed to the two non-ambiguous ones, how that weights into the squircle situation? Uh, very good idea. Um, we thought about some sort of behavioral manipulations to test, but haven't done it. You could bias the system initially through a sort of selective training regime, I would, mm -hmm. or you would call it. And then the prediction would be that you would have a sort of um, deviation from the sort of equal distribution. Yeah, good, very good point. And that should also, you should, you could also test a lot of um, fMRI predictions on that. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's a complicated with these um, environmental manipulations. Um, I'm not sure if, if you're aware of um, sort of previous work by about 15 years ago by the, um, by actually by both the O'Keefe and the Moser labs. Um, they do environmental um, deformations of, um, and then look what the, how the play cells behave. Uh, mm -hmm. And it depends also a bit on the order, how you, how you teach people, uh, um, rodents, the order of these different environments. Um, um, they, they usually use sort of morph environments between a, a circle and a square. And it, it depends a bit also on the, um, uh, on the order of the learning experience, but very good question. Yeah. Let me now, before um, we can, have some more time for a general discussion. Uh, show you one more um, study from another domain. Uh, this is on the temporal domain. Um, and I promise I keep it very brief and then conclude. Um, let's go back to the, uh, uh, to uh, actually, oh no, you can't see the slides yet. Uh, let's see, I need a bit. Just share my screen. Uh, so. all these windows. Um, can you see that now? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so what we know from um, electrophysiological recordings is that the, the grid cells, they are in, in the medial part of environmental cortex, MEC. Um, the uh, lateral environmental cortex um, is rather than being focused on um, spatial coding and codes other type of information. It also relates to, or possibly relates to differ differential anatomical connectivity profiles of MEC and LEC. So what the Moses discovered um, a couple of years ago is that in lateral enterovinal cortex, rather than medial enterovinal cortex, there seems to be information stored about uh, temporal information in a navigation cast. So it, it, the system is system is uh, sensitive not to spatial information but to temporal information, and there's also some evidence from human fMRI studies. Is this actually the lateral enterovinal cortex, which encodes temporal aspects of of memory episodes rather than the spatial aspect? And um, we wanted to understand that in a bit more detail and whether there is something like a temporal rather than a spatial mapping function function of of events, and. Uh, in this study, it's a navigation study, but it has this temporal component. We expose participants again to that 
big city design here, city um, environment. And they are exposed to different objects, 16 objects in total. And they always see these objects when they walk along a, a fixed route through the environment. So we can expose participants to these different objects in a very specific spatial, but also temporal order pattern. So, and what we, and that is uh, work done by Jakob Bermond, the postdoc in the group. Um, what, we, what we do is we expose participants to these environments, but then similar to the um, feature space study I presented before, what we do is in the scanner actually is we present only the object and we do that before the actual navigation task and after the navigation task. And then we can look at different pattern similarity measures of these single objects, whether our whether we, we, we have uh, see effects of our navigation manipulation or in that case, our temporal manipulation. Um, so what we do is the um, objects in the VR task have a specific temporal order and there's a specific temporal distance between these items and we expose them to the path all over again. So there's a systematic temporal difference between uh, object representations. Um, and we then look at our fMRI data, whether neural similarity scales with the temporal distance, participants have experienced these objects um, in the environment. And of course, we can also look at uh, spatial effects. And um, what we do for that analysis, that was a bit of a more tricky business, um, but we have done, and others like Amber Dizel's lab have done work before, it's not quite clear what the lateral and medial um, entorhinal cortex is, is actually in humans. So what is the homologue region? We did studies before where we, based on the differential connectivity profile informed by anatomy, helps us to identify these, um, these two clusters. First of all, we had to make sure that both sort of have the same signal strength. So various uh, signal to noise measures don't differ between the lateral and the medial part of entorhinal cortex. And then that's the last plot now. Um, we of course wanted to look whether there is a systematic relationship what we predicted in terms of the temporal distance between object and the neural representation. Um, so, sorry, wrong direction. Maybe I'll show them all then it becomes more clear. So what we do is um, we then um, look at the neural pattern similarity, again, a bit like the population vector analysis in rodents between different objects. We have these 16 objects. We can look at the uh, object to object neural similarity pattern and then correlate that, as I showed in my, briefly showed in my method slide, correlate that uh, with the actual temporal distance of objects in the VR task. And what we see is that the closer objects are together in the environment temporarily, the higher the neural similarity is after the learning experience. And what is very important that we control for the actual temporal distance in the presentation in the scanner, that is more like a baseline block. The, the temporal variations are introduced in the, in the session in between. And we also find that, and this is evident for, for the lateral part of entorhinal cortex and not the medial part of entorhinal cortex. And we also see a, a correlation of that strength of this neural similarity effect coding for temporal distance with the subsequent free recall um, memory performance. So people have then to freely recall these 16 items and they pack items which are, so there's, a, there's an effect of the experience before with how they pack them in the, in the free recall task. And that correlates with our uh, temporal neural similarity effect in lateral entorhinal cortex. So let me briefly summarize and wrap up or basically present a bit of an outlook. Uh, so we are super excited about these different types of cognitive maps, cognitive spaces, and we want to investigate them also in, in different modalities and look at interactions between sensory and, and, and these more cognitive representations. We think that like in the in the world in electrophysiology, deformations and distortions to these spaces might be a really interesting in window in understanding how they are represented. And if I would have had more time, that's why I had to skip some slides, I would have loved to present a study where we um, present deformed environments, trapezoid environments in virtual reality navigation and look how that affects the memory performance. So we see similar deformations and distortions like in the, um, the rodent recordings from entorhinal cortex. Um, 
And of course, it's interesting to relate that to other sort of abstract task spaces, uh, people, for instance, um, associate with medial prefrontal regions um, and, and other structures like parietal cortex. Um, having said that, I'm, I think I'm roughly on time, a bit over one. I'm sorry about that. Um, uh, I thanked already the people um, who actually did the work um, along the presentation, and I'm more than happy to take your questions now. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Christian. Uh, we have time for some questions. Let's start with questions for students first. Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Um, so you mentioned uh, informing uh, deep learning. And uh, so it seems like what the hippocampus, one of the roles that it might be doing is kind of learning the relevant variables, um, the, the relevant abstract variables that can be used for this um, context. And I'm curious if you think that there's some um, developmental structure that allows it to do this, or if there's more of a, you, you also mentioned that there's some dynamics going on and what might those be? Yeah, I mean, in terms of computational approaches uh, in that realm, um, of course you can um, refer to the, um, to the place and grid cell models, which are interesting, and we test some of them, so like boundary vector cell model, or um, in that study, which I initially wanted to also present, we, we used the successor representation model to simulate grid cells, and then also look how the simulated cells look, look in these various deformed environments, and then derive predictions for human behavior based on those. Um, I mean, maybe a more uh, even better angle for for your question would be I, I guess you have heard about that um, the Tolman Tolman Eichenbaum machine a model developed by um, Tim Barron's lab also in collaboration with Neil Virtues and Casper Berry um, where they just roughly uh, sort of assume that the entorhinal cortex represents some sort of structural knowledge of the environment and the hippocampal system sort of fills in events to that structure and the interaction between um, these two levels, um, uh, they apply that to various different uh, cognitive tasks, problems, and that seems to work pretty well, what I've seen. Um, in terms of uh, deep neural networks, we have, we have been using them in the past, um, uh, but not necessarily in understanding these spatial representations yet, but as if you like analysis tools, both on the physiology side and, and the neuroimaging side, um, and they seem to be much more sensitive um, than the, the sort of decoding approaches. But a deep mind, last sentence on that, um, uh, the company, the Google company from, um, from London, they had a nature paper, uh, also actually be collab collaborating with Casper Berry on how uh, artificial agents uh, navigate based on grid representation. That was quite a spectacular, and yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Any more uh, questions? Yeah. yeah, can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so the kind of conceptual spaces you described were mostly uh, abstract and, and, and tailored to the experiments. And I was wondering if you could uh, maybe theorize on like instances where uh, the abstract spaces have some prior regularity. So would that kind of disrupt or interact with, with uh, you know, uh, hexa, uh, hexagenal coding or, or uh, other forms of, of uh, spatialization? What do, you, what do you mean with prior structure? So for example, if you had like, um, maybe a very strong bias uh, towards safety in your uh, car, uh, car space uh, experiment. So like uh, an additional axis, and that's not like a latent variant, uh, uh, like the one you described in the three dimensional task, but, but, but an additional axis that, that uh, kind of uh, arranges the space uh, around it in a, in a non-equidirectional uh, manner. So would they interact or uh, are they coded separately? Yeah, that's a very, I mean, it's a very good question. I mean, what we're doing in the lab is, is, is very artificial, to be honest, to some extent. Um, 
maybe I, mean, I can actually answer with uh, with the idea which was mentioned during um, me presenting the uh, the Squircle study. So um, what how we could test that is through maybe selective pre-learning manipulations initially. You could sort of think along the lines of, I mean, the, the question wasn't by Louisa was in another direction on um, on circle versus square representation, but you could think along the same lines if you would sort of over represent one or two axes that might come for the price of under representing another one, and you could test these these um, pre learning effects effectively, and that might help to answer your question on um, uh, whether they, yeah. There is some sort of initial bias, yeah. There, it could also be in various factors like salience or, or task relevance. I mean, one axis could be more relevant in a specific situation than another. I mean, that's what I effectively um, describe in my example of remapping or how we think it works. First, you represent cars in a specific way, and then when it comes to buying one, of course, all the racing cars might already fall out because they are much much too expensive. So. If you're, Sort of have another representation of that. So various factors could play a role here, I think. But it's a good point. So you think it would remap essentially? Remapping would play. It that. would remap, and it it should be dynamic and flexible in the sense to really adapt to the current task demands. I mean, you what right. I what I said in my outline slide, all the work by Yael Niff and um, and uh, Jeff Schönbaum and others on. Effectively, they also talk about cognitive maps, but what they mean is abstract task spaces, if you like, uh, action options within a task space. And that is highly dynamic system, yeah? yeah. Depending on, on actual current demands. Thanks so much. I may ask a question. Yes. Uh, Christian, you, you presented the work on space and on uh, time and on abstract spaces. Do you find um, qualitative differences in between these spaces, or for you, they are representing uh, a similar metric, a similar uh, space based metric, something else? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, um, I can't really tell because we never tested that. We did run all these experiments differently, effectively. We have we have started with one study where we let them switch between the spaces. Um, so we teach participants um, to navigate in a virtual reality environment, and then they effectively are exposed to some objects in that environment, also in an abstract feature space. And then we look sort of how the relationships between the object changes of whether they are present in both the navigable space and the abstract space or in one only or in neither. So that goes maybe a bit in that direction. Um, whether it's a really the same coding principles. I mean, we, we, we tend to believe that because, but it might also be the way how we look at it. We analyze the data in a similar fashion like neural similarity measure to um, have a proxy measure of something like psychological distance, both in space and in these abstract spaces. But maybe we might be, we are wrong with that. So I think you would probably need to directly test the interaction between these different spaces in the same experiment. And then ideally, if that would work out, let's say deform one space and see whether you get a readout in the other space, something along those lines. I'm not sure if I answer your question, but that's that what came to my mind, yeah. Thanks. It's actually at the heart of the research question. Is it the same metric or not? Yeah. OK, so I think we'll stop here. Uh, thank you, Kirsten, for a fascinating talk. And uh, uh, see you all next week. Thanks very much for your attention. Really lovely. Uh, and thanks again for the invitation. It's always a bit uh, indirect. I would I prefer to see the faces of people when I talk. <laughs> and it's a bit like I, I speak into a machine. Um, but uh, nevertheless, I enjoyed it. Bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Bye-bye. Enjoy the